Hello, I'm Tess Lewis, a past co-chair of the Penn Translation Committee. Welcome to the second of three events in the 2021 series of bilingual readings brought to you by the Penn Translation Committee in celebration of Women in Translation Month. These Ah, uh, hello. <laughs> Hello, is anybody out there? Hello. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we're not hearing you, Tess. Um, hello, everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, as we can see, we cannot hear Tess right now. Um, but I'll jump straight into an introduction of myself and we'll start a reading right now. And I'm sorry about the inconvenience of technical difficulties. Um, my name is Jenna Tang, and I'm a New York-based selected translator for the 2021 Altai Emerging Translator Mentorship Program. I translate from Chinese and Spanish. My translations are published in Latin American Literature Today, the Asian American Writers Workshop, and elsewhere. My interviews can be found in World Literature Today and Words Without Borders. And Thank you, Tess, for that excellent introduction. I echo, I echo all her thanks. I'm so, so honored to be moderating this exciting and unique event where we are presenting five translators and their authors in bilingual readings in Portuguese, Chinese, Korean, Russian, Spanish, and English. The reading will be followed by a short Q&A session if time allows. So please submit your questions for any of the panelists and ask questions box instead of a general chat room in case it gets lost in all the comments and we'll ask as many as we can at the end of our session. Our first pair of readers will be translator Alton Uliana and author Carla Bessa. Alton Uliana has a master's degree in translation studies from University College London, where he's the co-editor of the Brazilian Translation Club. His published work includes short stories by Ana Maria Machado, Sergio Tavares, and Jacques Fox, upcoming plays by Howard Barker, and poems by Rufo Quindabal. Carla Bessa is a Brazilian writer, translator, actress, and theater director based in Germany. She is the author of three books, including Urubus, winner of the 2020 Jabuchi Prize in the short story category, and second place winner of the 2020 Brazilian National Library Award. Let's welcome Elton and Carla. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tess. Thank you, Jenna. Um, I'd like to say a few words before we start with the reading. Are you hear me, everyone? Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> so I just would like to say a few words about that book. This is my first, uh, my first book, a short story collection, short stories collection. Um, in the meantime, I've uh, published two, two other books, uh, another short story collection and a short novel. This book was uh, written uh, based on interviews I did uh, with women in Brazil uh, who lost their children to crime. So it is basically a book about uh, violence, uh, urban violence, 
um, domestic violence and violence against minorities. As for the form, um, I could add that I was working a lot with the verbatim technique. Um, I was pretty interested in uh, spoken word and I just transcribed the, the words as they were, they were told to me. So I see my work in that book rather in organizing and composing the texts than writing them in a conventional sense. So that said, I'd like to read a short, um, of the beginning of the story and then Elton in Portuguese for you to have the sound and Elton will read the story in English. So, aí eu fiquei sem esse filho. Tira a galinha do congelador e põe no micro-ondas. Passa a água que tinha acabado de ferver na garrafa térmica Põe o porta-filtro sobre a boca da garrafa. Põe o filtro no porta-filtro e o pó dentro, cinco colheres de sopa rasas. Depois eu tive. Meus filhos eu tive. Meus sete filhos, quer dizer, seis. Porque esse que mataram, eu nem nunca criei ele, não. Eu só cuidei dele no primeiro mês. Aí o pai dele roubou ele de mim. O pai sequestrou o garoto. Deixa a água fervida escorrer devagar sobre o pó de café até encher o filtro. Para, espera, até a água descer. O micro-ondas apita. Ela anda com a chaleira na mão e aperta o botão do micro-ondas. E faz abrir a porta. Faz menção de tirar a galinha, mas desiste, porque só tem uma mão livre. Ele me bateu. Eu tenho isso aqui no meu rosto, ó, meio quebrado. Foi ele. Pois é. É por isso que eu tenho o um rosto meio assim, meio deformado, né? Se você olhar bem. Põe mais água sobre o pó, para, espera. Thank you, Clara. Uh, thank you, Pan America. Thank you, Jenna and Tess and everybody at home. Uh, before I read, I'm just going to say uh, just one uh, couple of points about these texts. This is a, a fascinating uh, experiment with form. And as Carla said, she's using a verbatim uh, technique. So the piece can actually be read as a dramatic piece. Uh, and uh, there are two distinctive, very contrasting layers of uh, discourse. One is uh, the setting of the scene, so the, the meticulous, precise description of the scene in the action, uh, and it's juxtaposed with this convoluted, emotionally and syntactically almost chaotic telling of the story. So this uh, woman is relaying this very heartbreaking story. Uh, so I'm just going to read the story for you in English. Uh, So it was then that I lost that child by Carla Besser. She takes the chicken out of the freezer and puts it in the microwave. She rinses the thermos with boiling water. She puts the filter holder over the mouth of the flask. She, pastes, she places the paper filter in the holder and fills it with coffee powder, five level soup spoons. And so then, I had my children, I had seven children, I mean six, because the one who got killed, I never really got to raise him. I couldn't, I only, I only had him for the first month, then his father stole my child from me. Yes, it was his father, he kidnapped my boy. She pours the hot water carefully over the coffee until the filter is full. She stops and waits for the water to seep through. The microwave beeps. With the kettle in one hand, she, with the kettle in one hand, she goes to the microwave, presses the button that opens the door to remove the chicken. She realizes she has only one hand free and poses. He beat me up. I've got the scars here on my face, see? ruined. It was him. That's why I've got a face like this. Oh, destroyed. Have a look. 
She pours more water on the coffee. She stops and waits. He stole my son and I reported him. And so it was his mother that had to look after my son. He and his mother raised my son, but they never let me visit him. Then I took them to court again and I won. I won the right to see my own son, a right that was already mine. She puts the kettle back on the still burning stove. She grabs some bread out of the basket and puts it on the table, along with the Itambé butter and Minas Prescal cheese. The water boils again. She pours some more into the flask. His mother, she would bring the boy over once in a while. Then the boy starts growing, growing up, and they sent him to work on the streets selling stuff. He was walking around filthy, smelly, and scruffy. He ended up dropping out of school, giving up. And then I spoke to the teacher and arranged for him to go back to continue his studies. She realizes the thermos is full. She takes the filter holder and puts it in the sink. Halfway there, she spills coffee on her arm. Oh, shit. She screws the lid on and brings the, thermo to the, the thermos to the table. She opens it again and pours me a cup of coffee. She asks, milk? I say, yes. She pours the milk, pours the coffee, milk, and she was going to get the sugar, but she changes her mind. She shakes her head and gets the sweetener instead. Zero cal. But let me go back a bit. When his father took him to be raised by his grandmother, they didn't let me visit him, you know. They wouldn't even let me speak to him. And on the days we did meet and he actually came to speak to me, then he would be beaten just because he had talked to me. A proper grown-up beating. They hurt the boy all over. She butters the bread, which is still warm. The butter starts to melt. She rubs the tip of her tongue on the edge of the roll to stop the butter dripping on the tablecloth. She takes a bite of the bread, which she holds with her right hand. She places her left hand underneath her chin in the shape of a shell to catch any drops or crumbs. She throws the bread crumbs, the bread crumbs in her mouth and chews and swallows everything. She eats with appetite, take long sips of coffee and blowing the hot drink between one thing and another. Then he ran away. He turned up with this woman and they went to live right here, just around the corner from me. But that wasn't everything. He ended up on the wrong side of the track because the woman he got involved with was one of those she was one of those drug addicts. He fell into the trap straight away. All I know is that the woman, I don't know what happened there, but the woman, she made a deal with two of her cousins and some of her friends and told them, kill him. And they killed him at home, inside the house, while he was sleeping. They took a huge stone like this look and they threw it on top of him. And if that wasn't enough, they shot him several times, those guys. They killed him right then and there, sleeping at home. She places the cup on the saucer and the bread next to it. She wipes her mouth with the back of her right hand. It was then that I lost that child. Thank you so much for such wonderful meeting, Kala and Elton. Our next Thank pair you. of readers will be translator Dom Espister and author Do, Do Zhong Mei. Dom Espister is an associate professor of women's and gender studies at the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Her research and teaching includes collective memory, immigration, transnational feminism, environmental humanities, 
ecotourism, women's literature, and translation and interpreting studies. She has published scholarly and creative works in English and Chinese. Zuo Zhongmei is a prolific writer from the Yi ethnic group in China. She has published multiple prose collections, as well as a recipient of the Dali Literature and Art Award, the Yunnan Provincial Foundation Award for Creative Works, and the Lin Shui Ethnic Literary Award. Dong will be introducing briefly about her translation and Zhongmei's work, and we'll be playing Zhongmei's video, um, pre-recorded video for everyone later. Okay, thank you, Jenna, for introducing us <clears throat> and moderating today's reading. Thank you for taking the time to communicate or meet with us to provide details and answer our questions. And we'd also like to thank um, the Translation Committee of Pan America for organizing the reading series. And it's a great honor for us to be included in today's session to share our work, our translation, and learn from uh, the other panelists. And the excerpt we are going to read is Buckwheat from Zuo's prose, Womanly Crops. It's included in Chinese Women Writers on the Environment, a multi-ethnic anthology of fiction and nonfiction. And the book was published by McFarland uh, in 2020. And I co-edited uh, the book and also translated or uh, co-translated a few pieces on um, this is uh, the book. And um, so in most E areas in Southwest China, buckwheat together with oat and potato was a staple food and has had ritual meanings in the E culture. Um, so now uh, we're going to listen to Zuo's reading. Thank you. Chang 来表达对古生的无上敬意而林家的田草面就好一些开的一片一片雪白的是古桥花那荞麦面与狼放了身份成了稀奇货有一年七天
The first crop that comes to mind is buckwheat. Back in the day, buckwheat was a food of hot times. Deep in my memory, my family would eat corn gudafan, a kind of dumpling. Rice was typically for the Yi New Year's and the other festivals. Even when rice was cooked on festive occasions, it would simply be a thin layer covering the bottom of our cooking pot. On top of the rice sat gudafan. Grandmother used the cooked rice to venerate our ancestors. By showing them we had rice to eat, she wanted them to feel happy. We had a sack of buckwheat flour in a cabinet upstairs. The flour looked sage green. We kept it for emergencies. If there was a shortage of corn flour, we would use buckwheat flour to feed the family. Buckwheat gudafan needed to be cooked in a rice steamer. Even when cooked, it maintained its green color. It had a bitter taste. Our next door neighbor had sweet buckwheat flour that looked light gray and tasted better. Food made with this flour had a hint of sweetness and was easier on the palate than that made of bitter buckwheat. Villagers would grow buckwheat on the highest, most distant mountains. They chose to grow more bitter buckwheat because of its higher yield. Buckwheat is an autumn crop. Bitter buckwheat flowers, as white as snow, bloom on high mountains. Fuchsia is the color of sweet buckwheat flowers. Buckwheat flowers are beautiful. How come a crop of hot times can have such beautiful flowers as simple and pretty as village girls? I wonder about that. Nowadays, buckwheat has largely vanished as a staple crop. Occasionally, someone in a remote village grows one or two patches of buckwheat, but buckwheat flowers have assumed a completely different identity as it is now a rarity. Buckwheat food is set to help improve diabetic conditions. Many people with diabetes now ask around for buckwheat flour. Sometimes the best hotel in the small town of Yangbi serves buckwheat cakes with honey dip. Customers battle each other to get at these cakes and sing the praises of this genuine organic food. On autumn day, the County Writers Association took us to Shimenguan to gather story materials. As our vehicle was halfway up to the mountain, I saw fuchsia flowers, but I had to look really hard before I was sure they were indeed buckwheat. A narrow stretch of fog gently hugged the mountain. The buckwheat flowers were blooming beautifully. I hadn't seen buckwheat flowers like this for years. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a beautiful reading, Dong and also Zhong Mei. Our next pair of readers will be translator Soji and author Saran Chong. The readers are pre-recorded due to the time difference. <laughs> Soji is a translator of Li Hei Mi's Unexpected Vanilla, Che Jingyong's To the Warm Horizon, and Lisa Ho's Cat Calling, they also make chokwa, a quarterly easing featuring one Korean poem and multiple English translations. Saren Chong is the highly acclaimed and beloved author of nine novels, two illustrated novellas, two short story collections, and an essay collection. Her novel, The School of Mary's Files, was adapted into a Netflix original series in 2020. Let's welcome Sojay and Sarah.
마티아 쓰레기 언제나 잘할 성향이 있었다고 말하는 의식이 있지만 나는 그게 사실이 아니란 걸 안다. 조건 결과에서 밝혀졌듯이 강과 앞에는 기껏해야 몇년더 버티고 싶었고 마지막으로 나와 유대표를 망치고 싶었던 것일 뿐이다. 하지 않으면 좋을 상상이 있지만 죽음을 준비하는 마티아스가 콩머레를 부르는 모습도 조금 큽니다. 나에게 바치는 그렇지만 그러나 디테일을 따지자면 실제로 일어나는 일은 하나도 담지 않은 연속은 있어지고 변호사에게 단호한 지시사항을 남기면서 바라게 창은 정원으로 나 있었으므로 마티아스는 4층에서 거리 쪽으로 뛰어내렸다. 더 높은 층을 두고 굳이 거리 쪽을 뛰는 것이 그다웠다. 4층에서 떨어지고도 살아남는 사람들이 있지만 그는 아니었다. 대학에 집중하였다. 사랑했기에 나의 배신이 견딜 수 없었다 썼고 그럼에도 그림과 빛과 모든 재산을 내 앞으로 남겨으므로 나는 온 유럽의 증오를 받아내야 했다. 재능 있는 화가를 파멸로 몰아넣은 아시아 마녀가 되었다. 미디어는 지금보다 느렸지만 그때 사람들이 지금 사람들 못지않게 가슴을 살아있다. 조롱에서 폭력으로 넘어가는 시간은 훨씬 짧았고 말이다. 창문으로 날아드는 깨진 판석, 집 앞에 버려지는 오물, 길에서 마주치는 사소한 위협들이 돌을 넘어섰다. 아티아스가 바람 내고 있다. 아무도 그의 의도를 해석하지 못했고, 돌바닥에 깨진 그의 머리가 마지막으로 계획한 것은 차곡차곡 체인되었다. 어떤 자살은 가해였다. 아주 최종적인 형태의 가해였다. 그가 죽이고 싶었던 건그 자신이기도 했지만 그보다도 나의 행복, 나의 예술, 나의 사랑이었던 게 분명하다. 그가 되살아날 수 없는 것처럼 나도 회복하지 못했지만 하는 집요한 의지에 실행했다. 요제프와 나는 파리에 가서 미네방에 집에 몸을 숨겼다. 기술드루프에서 프랑크푸르트로, 프랑크푸르트에서 파리로 마치 누가 그린 듯한 동선이었다. 내방의 아버지는 그 당시 파리에 그만한 집을 마련했다. 마련해 줬다는 점에서 홍인지 구역자의 수상한 사업을 가지고 있었던 것으로 아직까지도 의심했지만 딸 가진 아버지로는 시대를 앞선 사람이었다. 그런 아버지 없이는 빌리스 어기를 운감하기도 어려운 시대였고 그런 시대가 끝난 것만이 위안이다. 법을 지은 우리를 겁이라고 넘는 내방이 되고 있다. 내방은 유산의 위험이 있는 나를 위해 길치기마다 믿었다. 안정권에 들어가다 함께 한국으로 들어가다 보니 여러 개방이었다. 한국에는 그때까지 고려 대상이 아니었지만 온 유럽이 나를 미워하였고 괜찮은 선택이 됐다. 요제프도 그때는 동의했다. 에바의 귀국도 바로 열 전체에 펼쳐지고 들어갈 짧은 평원을 떠나라고 부탁한 것은 기운 없이 물론 나를 붙게 대한 대처였지만 그 이후로 모든 것이 바뀌었다. 나의 말은 그렇게 돌아왔고 있습니다. 아마도 일종의 신문 식탁에 가까웠을 것이다. 신수선이 한국에 돌아왔을 때 계층, 주의가, 직업이 바뀌어 있었고 그것은 미네방의 가슴이었다. 유럽에서 얻은 악명을 일종의 신비로움으로 변화되는 것은 시선의 능력이 아니었다. 할머니를 아는 화주는 생략된 부분들을 읽어낼 수 있었다. 미네방이 그 모든 것을 이루어지게 했다. 말을 흘리거나 전하고 시선과 사람들 사이에 가기가 되어 일종의 매니저처럼 커리어를 만들어냈다. 화려한 기타를 가진 새처럼 부풀리기를 잘하는 사람이었지만 그 재주를 자신을 위해서가 아니라 자신이 좋아하는 일을 위해 썼기 때문에 사람들이 알면서도 속아졌다는 이유가 아니다. 그러나 사실 여사라고 불릴 만한 나이가 되기 전에 세상을 떴기 때문에 사실은 물론 명예남매들도 잘 기억하지 못했다. 부자가 많았지 대학교 입학할 때마다 근사한 만년필 같은 걸 사고 그리고 따랐던 것도 같은데 지난 향수를 뿌렸는데 참 좋았어 무슨 향이 왔을까? 진짜? 강남처럼 매번 영원히를 자기 달라고 했다 어렴풋한 이미지로밖에 그릴 수 없는 오래된 사진으로만 남은 할머니의 친구가 할머니를 한국 미적에 안착시켰다 그 좋지 않은 상황에서도 끝까지 따온 학기가 도움이 되었다 마음만 먹었다면 다시 그림을 그릴 수도 있었을 텐데 본인이 원하지 않았다고 한다. 그림을 그리던 사람이 어떻게 그림을 그리지 않을 수 있었는지 그렇게까지 뚝 붙여버렸는지 주변에서는 이해하지 못했지만 어느 날 질려버린 더 이상 그리지 않았고 이미 그렸던 것을 처분해버렸다. 마티아스가 억지로 떠맡긴 그림들과 
할머니가 두고 온 그림들은 이들도록 때 남아 먼지들이 미쳤다가 분한답니다. 사라졌다가 이제 시내에 떠오르기도 시선은 한국으로 돌아와 그림을 그리는 대신 그릴 수 없다. 처음에는 독일어나 영어를 번역한 듯한 한국어로 귀한 정서를 만들어내는 썼고 언어 감각이 점점 회복돼 있고 자유로 자연스러우면서 뜨겁게 썼다. 열두에 처음에 딸이 짧은 글을 썼고 기사 기사 잡지 보고 싶다가 남원군에 있었다. 한 개월쯤 체류하다 본 것이 일 년이 됐고 이 년이 됐고 끝내 돌아가지 않았다. 1 년을 넘겨버리자 저도 이제 그때 혼자 두려워 돌아갔다. 세상은 사람과 자신의 언어 중에 언어를 선택한 사람이 있다. 퍼져 나오는 말들을 밖으로 잠들 수는 없었던 사람. 감사합니다. 하이, 마이 네임 이즈 소제 앤 아이 더 트랜슬레이터 of From s h i s n Onward by s e r a n g c h u n g Each chapter begins with an extended epigraph from the central character s h i s n who was a writer and an artist. Then the rest of the chapter jumps to the narrative present where s h i s n has been dead for 10 years and her descendants are piecing together s h i s n s life story. So, I'll be reading an excerpt from chapter 18 chosen by the author herself. We moved from Dusseldorf to Frankfurt, and there I became pregnant with my first child. Although it was just a train ride away, we thought people in a new city would be indifferent to us. Who was it? Who went out of their way to share my news with Matthias? While some people say Matthias always had suicidal tendencies, I know that's not true. As the autopsy revealed, his liver and lungs would have endured for a few more years at best. He just wanted to utilize his inevitable end to ruin me and Yosef one last time. I know I shouldn't, but I often imagine Matthias humming as he prepared to die. The way he wrote a suicide note come devotional love letter to me that contained only falsities and left firm instructions for his lawyer. The attic windows faced the garden, so Matthias instead jumped from the fourth floor onto the street. It was very characteristic of him to choose the street over the higher floor. Some people survive falling from the fourth floor, but he did not. He died instantly. Because he wrote that he could not live with my betrayal because he loved me, yet left his paintings, house, and property to me, I had to endure all of Europe's hatred. I became the Asian witch who destroyed the talented painter. The media was slower then, but people loved gossip as much as they do now. It didn't take long before mockery turned into violence. Bricks flew through my windows, trash and sewage were dumped upon my house, and minor threats on the street soon escalated to something worse. It was all as Matthias wished. No one saw through his intentions, his final plans drawn before his head smashed on the pavement, being carried out one by one. Certain suicides are acts of violence, a final act of violence. Part of what he wanted to kill was himself, but he most certainly wanted to kill my happiness, my art, and my love as well. Just as he couldn't come back to life, he intended for me to never recover from his death. Yosef and I went to Paris and hid ourselves away in b i n e v a n g s home. From Dusseldorf to Frankfurt, from Frankfurt to Paris, we moved as if following choreography. e v a n g s father is still suspected as having been a colonial collaborator for owning a suspicious business and providing Evan with such a home in Paris in those impoverished times. But he certainly was an enlightened father to his daughter. The times made it difficult to be independent and brave without a father like him. And what a relief it is that such times are over. Evan, ever so fearless, protected us when we were scared beyond our wits. She even delayed her return for me so I wouldn't miscarry. It was also Evan who, once things became a bit safer for me, suggested that we all fly to Korea together. Returning to Korea had not been a considered option, but seemed reasonable when the entirety of Europe despised me. Yosef, too, agreed it was for the best. When Evan asked me to write a short review for a forthcoming exhibition brochure, it was probably a gesture of encouragement on her part to coax me out of my listlessness. But everything changed after that. From 
And so my words came back to me, 1997. It was likely a kind of identity laundering. When Shim Sun returned to Korea, her class status and occupation had changed, all thanks to Minetang. Transforming her notoriety from Europe into an engrossing mystery wasn't Shi Sun's doing. Hwasu, the Shi Sun's granddaughter, could read between the lines. Minetang made it all happen by spilling or disseminating information, serving as a bridge between Shi Sun and others, building her career like a manager. The good lady Minevang would expertly puff up like a bird with magnificent feathers, and people let themselves be, be deceived by her because they understood she used her talents not for herself, but for those she liked. However, she passed away before she was old enough to be called a good lady like that, so none of Shizan's children remembered her clearly. She wore a lot of fancy hats, right? Whenever we started at a new school, she bought us nice fountain pens for things like that. I think we liked her quite a bit. She wore a heavy perfume that was really nice. What was the scent? Gardenia? She'd always joke about adopting Yelman. The grandmother's friend, who remained only in old photographs and vague memories, had established her grandmother in the Korean art world. The degrees she saw had doggedly managed to attain during her crisis proved helpful. If she'd wanted to, she, she could have painted again, but she said she didn't want to. People didn't understand how a painter could stop painting just like that, but she ceased altogether and disposed of her earlier work. The painting Matias forcibly gave her, and those she left behind in Dusseldorf collected dust, were stolen or forgotten, and would occasionally resurface. In Korea, she's on rote instead of painting. At first, she created a peculiar affect in Korean that sounded like translated German or English, then soon recovered her linguistic sensibility to write naturally and powerfully. She began with short essays and published in various magazines until she got a book contract. What was intended as a three-month stay turned into a year, two years, and she never went back. After a decade, Josef Lee returned to Germany alone. Between love and language, Shizan had chosen language. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sojay and Saram. Our next pair of readers will be translator Kathleen E. Young and author Anastara Benitz. Kathleen E. Young is the author of Woman Drinking Absent and Day of the Border Guards. She has translated prose by Atam Alinsley and Anastara Benitz and poetry by numerous Rusabong writers. Young was named a 2017 NEA Translation Fellow, and she served as the inaugural poet laureate for Arlington, Virginia. Anna Stadabinitz writes in multiple genres, including journalism, science fiction, horror, and children's books. All her novels have been nominated for the Russian National Bestseller Prize. In 2014, Stadabinitz won the National Bestseller Prize in the Young Writers category. Look at Him is her only book length work of nonfiction. And let's welcome Catherine and Anna. And unfortunately, Anna today has experienced some technical difficulties and we'll have Catherine read through the Russian part and also the English part. And let's welcome Catherine. Thanks so much, Jenna. Um, today, uh, I'm gonna be reading from Anna Starobinitz's memoir, Look at Him. Our reading begins as Anna is, is go undergoing a 16 week ultrasound in what has so far been a very normal pregnancy. But the doctor discovers that the baby's kidneys are five times larger than they should be. And he says that the baby may have something called polycystic kidney disease. I'm gonna read a short portion of the text in Russian. And uh, for those of you who are native speakers, I apologize for my accent. Uh, we were hoping to have Anna with us today and we've had some technical difficulties, but I will soldier on. This is from the first chapter, uh, Barok um, of Pasmetri na Nyubo. Считается, что первая стадия горя – это отрицание. Узнав ужасную новость, ты якобы не можешь сразу в нее поверить. Ты утверждаешь, утверждаешь что это просто ошибка, или что тебе сознательно врут, что врач УЗИ – шалатан, что он отправляет тебя на другое УЗИ к своему приятелю, чтобы выкачивать деньги. Да, я видела такое на форумах, посвященных патологиям беременности. И даже моя мама, 
узнав о результатах УЗЕ, на моих глазах очень скоро пройдет эту стадию. Это нормальный защитный механизм. Но у меня он почему-то не срабатывает. Еще до того, как я полезла в интернет читать про поликистоз, еще до того, как прозвучал диагноз, еще тот момент, когда он смотрел в монитор и молчал, я поняла, что все очень плохо. Да, действительно плохо. Я оплачиваю УЗИ и выхожу на ноябрьскую мокрую тьму. Иду по улице, потом соображаю, что я вообще-то приехала на машине, но не могу вспомнить, где я ее поставила. Минут двадцать я брожу вокруг центра акушерства и гинекологии на большой пироговке. То и дело забывая, что именно я тут ищу. Идти тяжело, как будто я двигаюсь внутри густого черного, черного облака. Потом я все-таки наблюдаю на свою машину, забираюсь внутрь и лезу в мобильный интернет. Я набираю поликистоз почек плода и открываю, открываю ссылки. И понимаю, что поликистоз бывает двух типов – доминантный или взрослый и рецептивный, инфантильный. Что доминантный – это как раз такое, которое есть и у других родственников, и с ним обычно живут. А рецептивный – это как в моем случае, если это мой случай. На фотографиях. Уродливые младенцы с сплюснутыми лицами и огромными раздутыми животными. Мертвые младенцы с поликистозом инфантильного типа не выживают. Okay, switching to English. It said the first stage of grief is denial. Having learned terrible news, It's as if you can't immediately take it in. You maintain that it's just a mistake or that they're knowingly lying to you, that the ultrasound doctor is a charlatan, that he's sending you to his friend for another ultrasound in order to take your money. Yes, I've seen that kind of thing in online chat rooms dedicated to the, to the pathology of pregnancy. And even my mother, having learned the results of the ultrasound, passes through this stage very quickly, right before my eyes. It's a normal defense mechanism, but for some reason, it doesn't work for me. Even before I went online to read about polycystic kidney disease, even before the diagnosis was announced, in that moment when he looked at the monitor and was silent, I understood that things were very bad, really bad. I pay for the ultrasound and go out into the wet November darkness. I walk along the street, Then I grasp that I'd come in a car, but I can't remember where I left it. For 20 minutes, I drag myself around the obstetrics and gynecology clinic on Bolshaya Piragovka Street, forgetting what exactly I'm looking for. It's hard to walk, as if I'm moving inside a thick black cloud. Eventually, I stumble upon my car, climb in, and go online on my phone. I type in fetal polycystic kidney disease and open up more and more links. And I understand that polycystic kidney disease occurs in two types, dominant or adult and recessive infantile. The dominant polycystic kidney disease is exactly the kind that runs in families and that people generally live with it. But recessive is what we're talking about in my case, if it is my case. In the photographs, there are deformed infants with flattened faces and giant inflated stomachs, dead infants. They don't survive with infantile polycystic kidney disease. The thick black cloud surrounding me suddenly begins to crawl into my mouth and my throat. I'm suffocating. There's absolutely nothing for me to breathe. The other me, the one who's calm and cold, notices then that I'm not simply sitting in the car and staring at the telephone screen, gasping for breath, 
but am at the same time driving along 10th anniversary of October Street and everyone's honking at me because I'm crawling into oncoming traffic. By some miracle, I managed to drive home all the same. I can't breathe. And when my daughter, Sasha, we call her Little Badger, comes happily running with the question, is it a boy or a girl? And my husband, also Sasha, comes out of the kitchen with wet hands and inquires offhandedly, is everything okay? I can't speak and only gasp and gasp for air, but there is no air. My black cloud doesn't let it into my lungs. What's wrong with the baby? Big Sasha grabs me by the soldiers, by the shoulders. What's wrong with our baby? Little Badger looks at us in fright and prepares to cry. The observant calm me also looks at us and reproachfully. She doesn't like the fact that we're scaring our daughter. She doesn't like the fact that I can't pull myself together. But it amuses her that we all seem to be playing a scene from a soap opera. I can't breathe, I sob, exactly as if I were fulfilling the conventions of the genre. My husband brings me a small glass of whiskey and says, drink it down. Looking at my stomach, which hasn't been showing all that long at all, he adds, nothing bad will happen to the baby from such a tiny amount. Drink. I swallow the contents of the glass, and I really do relax. I breathe. I look at Little Badger and Big Badger. Just this morning, we were discussing what the new baby's nickname would be. Sasha was afraid the baby would usurp her position of Little Badger, but I said we'd call the baby Littlest Badger and no one would be offended. And now I say to them both, say to my badgers, it's a boy, but he won't live, probably. For the rest of the night, my husband and I sit at the computer reading about polycystic kidney disease. From time to time, I weep. But my husband tells me that nothing's definite yet, that we need first to wait for the ultrasound with an expert, that I'm panicking too soon. And Little Badger makes me a card with a drawing of a flower. Mama, everything will be fine, is written on it in the clumsy handwriting for which they scold her in school. And she also drags all her toys to me, one after the other, and says they'll be my talismans, that they'll protect me. That same night, for the first time in 16 weeks, the baby begins to stir inside me. Their soft sliding movements, as if he's stroking me, as if we've all gathered together, the whole Badger family, except Big Badger and Little Badger are on the outside and Littlest Badger is inside me. As if everything will be fine, like in the movies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, for reading both Russian and English. And thank you for Anna's amazing works in Russian. Our final pair of readers will be translator Robin Myers and author Eliana Hernandez Bachon. Robin Myers is a Mexico City based poet and translator. Recent and forthcoming translations include Another Life by Daniel Libara, Cars on Fire by Monica Ramon Rios, A Restless Dead by Cristina Rivera Garza in Animals at the End of the World by Gloria Susana Esquivel. She writes a monthly column on translation for palette poetry. Born in Bogota, Colombia, Eliana Hernandez Bachon is a poet. She has an MFA in creative writing in Spanish from NYU. She currently lives in Brooklyn, New York. La Mata is her first book. The illustrations in the book were done by the Colombian artist Maria Isabel Rueda. Let's welcome Robin and Eliana. Uh, thank you. I want to thank uh, Tess and Jenna and everyone else that is working now to make this reading possible. Um, today we're going to read a, a selection of poems from La Mata, The Brush. This book is a polyphonic account of the massacre that happened in El Salado, Colombia. Uh, this was committed by paramilitary groups in the year 2000 with the complicity of Colombian military. Uh, this year, there has been 65 massacres in different regions of Colombia. 
la mata. Las ramas que se cruzan en el fondo del monte no pueden contarse, tienen un principio vital, como los dedos gordos heredados de la familia y las cosas que caen sin remedio del cielo, torrente el agua lluvia. El agua lluvia golpea insistente las costras, el agua lluvia atenta contra la solidez de las piernas, humedece con su lengua el agua lluvia las cosas, las rosetas, las ciénagas, las aguas verdes del litoral. Así se abren los cartos como frailejones, se abren las gencianas, teresitas y los cachitos, los geranios silvestres, las orquídeas pregaderas que crecen solo lejos del mar. Y en el arbolar que digiere con dificultad el monte, hay matorrales encañadas que nadie distingue. El pelo del monte se enmaraña en tigrecido, chasquean, las barbas colgantes del líquen chasquean. Because we're going to be going back and forth, I'd like to just add my thanks quickly to Jenna, to Tess, to Pen America, to Eliana, of course, to everyone who's listening and to our fellow readers. The brush. The limbs crisscrossing deep inside the woods are numberless. They have a vital purpose, like stout fingers passed down by blood and everything that falls inexorably from the sky, torrential rain. Rainwater batters scabs, rainwater pummels at the leg's solidity, rainwater wets things with its tongue, the tiny buds, the swamps, the green course of the littoral. And so the thistles part like frailejones, the gentians, acacias, and periwinkles, the wild geraniums, the folding orchids, and the plegaderas that only grow far from the sea. And in that tangled grove, the struggles to digest the land are thickets in ravines now hidden to the eye. The forest's hair snags angrily. They snap and snap the hanging beards of lichen. Señalan los investigadores. Como esa bala, ese día se dispara en otras 70, de las cuales solo 10 impactan en los árboles. Mientras se disparan las balas, suena música alegre. La razón por la que suena música alegre es porque luego de disparar las balas, quieren tocar el tambor. Antes de reunirlos a todos en la plaza y hacer las preguntas correspondientes, sacan los equipos de sonido y el tambor de las casas y hacen tronar esa música alegre. En los oídos de todos, el estruendo de las balas se confunde con un redoble. The researchers explain. 70 more of those bullets are fired that day. A mere 10 strike the trees. As the bullets are fired, cheerful music plays. Cheerful music plays because, having fired the bullets, they want to play the drums. Before gathering everyone in the town square to ask the necessary questions, they bring out the audio equipment and drums from the houses and play this cheerful music loud and clear. In everyone's ears, the clamor of the bullets muddles with the drum roll. Dicen los testigos. Oímos algo, sí, pero no dijimos nada, no logramos decir. El agua lluvia se ha golpeado en las cornisas. Oímos algo, pero era la baba del caracol vertiéndose, el calor del verano, el fastidio, relamiendo las caras. Creímos que era el traca-traca del tren. No dijimos nada. De todos modos, ¿qué podíamos decir y que escucharan? ¿Cuántas gentes no sabían ya? Somos bien hombres. ¿Será que si abrimos la boca podremos olvidar? Nos fuimos. De los montes hacia el norte, ya sabemos, viene generoso el viento. The witnesses say, yes, we heard something, but we said nothing. We couldn't say anything. The rainwater swarmed on the windowsills. We heard something, but it was a snail trail slicking along the summer heat, irritation licking our faces. We thought it was the click clack of the train. We said nothing. And anyway, what could we have said that they would have heard? Didn't everyone know by then? We're real men. If we open our mouths, will we be able to forget? We left. Northward from the forest, as we know, blows the wind generous. Vuelve la mata. Todo el verde que crece, como un torrente de agua se desliza, acaricia bromelias y cachitos, abre las flores su verdín. Y entre esa tupida maraña de verde, 
se oyen las ramas golpeando en el aire, muerde la moleza un suelo arcilloso, en lo raso del cielo se escucha el crujir de las ramas y luego un pie en el aire, la pierna levantada da un paso. The brush returns. Everything green that grows torrential slips along, caresses periwinkles and bromeliads, peels back their emerald mist. And from that dense green snarl, there comes the scrape of limbs colliding in the air, the thickets tearing at a clayey soil. Heard from the open sky, the branches creak, and then a foot thrust in the air. A raised leg takes a step. Continúa la mata. Cuando caen los cuerpos en la plaza, elegidos al azar, quedan en las casas, los patios, las cocinas, las sabanas extendidas, recibiendo aún la tibieza del sol. Quedan con sus capas las cosas, plegándose unas sobre otras. Preguntan el por qué, el esto, el ahora. No piensan antes de hablar las cosas. Se llevan todo por delante, como cuando se descarrilaban los trenes antiguos. The brush continues. When the bodies collapse in the town square, picked out at random, the houses are left behind with their yards, their kitchens, their sheets pressed smooth, receiving still the sun's warm touch. Things are left with their layers creased into each other, asking why this now. Things don't think before speaking. They charge ahead like old trains derailing. Preguntan los investigadores, ¿qué les hicieron? ¿A los que mataron los mataron porque venían en la lista o porque se querían defender? ¿Y ese día qué más hicieron? ¿Alguna advertencia? ¿Por dónde llegaron? ¿Y a ese otro muchacho por qué se lo llevaron? ¿A quién se lo robaba? Nos contaron del señor que iba en un burro. ¿Dónde fue eso? ¿Cómo fue eso? ¿En cuántos volaron? ¿Las conexiones estaban hace mucho o se hacían y se deshacían? ¿Se quedaron como sentinelas? Se fueron, luego de ese día se fueron. The researchers ask, what had they done to them? Did they kill the ones they killed because they were on the list or because they tried to defend themselves? What else did they do that day? Was there any warning? How did they get here? That other boy, why did they take him away? Who said he'd stolen their animals? We heard about the man riding a burro. Where did that happen? How did that happen? How many did they shatter into? Were the connections made a long time ago or were they made and unmade again and again? Did they stay behind as lookouts? Did they leave? Did they leave after that day? Dicen los testigos. Ese día cuando llegaron al pueblo preguntaron si los guerrillos vivían ahí, si tenían mujeres ahí. Preguntaron si bailaban. También si les cocinaban ahí, si pegaba duro el sol ahí, si paseaban de vez en cuando. Mientras preguntaban, querían saber si habían ido antes al fin del mundo, si habían hecho el amor ahí, si tenían gallos y si sus gallos cantaban o cacareaban, si cantaban con el sol como los gallos normales, o si estaban desfasados y cantaban a las 11, a las 7, a las 10. Se ve días en los que no cantaban. The witnesses say that day when they reached the village, they asked if gorillas lived there, if they had women there, if they danced. Also, if the women cooked for them there, if the sun beat down hard there, if they took the occasional stroll. And they asked, they wanted to know if they'd gone to the end of the world, if they'd made love there, if they had roosters, and if their roosters sang or crowed, if they sang with the sun like normal roosters, or if they were confused and sang at 11 at 7, at 10 o'clock, if there were days when they didn't sing at all. Señala la mata. Frente a la extensión de la noche, las formas ocultas de la vida, la tosudez de cornejos herbáceas, el concierto feroz de las chicharras, el germen de la miel. ¿Cómo no tener orgullo? ¿Cómo no unirse a esa inflorescencia indestructible y bella? Mientras, arrece el aguacero. Interrumpe la siesta de los niños en las casas. Corta el día con su sentencia. The brush remarks, Before the night's expanse, life's hidden forms, the stubborn ferns and dogwood, the ruthless concert of cicadas, the seed of honey. How could you not be proud, not join that inflorescence, indestructible and ravishing? 
Meanwhile, the rain intensifies and interrupts the sleep of children in their beds, adjourns the daylight with its sentence. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eliana and Robin. That was such an amazing reading. And what a treat to hear all these voices from around the world. A huge thank you to all of our readers. <laughs> it looks like we do have some time for questions and let's check out our Q&A box. <laughs> we have one question from Matthew. Um, he said, all of the readings were lovely. So thanks so much for them. I wonder if Carla might explain the verbatim technique in a bit more detail and if Alton could speak to some of the intricacies of translating it or those multiple levels of discourse he referenced. Hearing it in both versions was quite powerful. Thank you. Would Carla or Elton like to speak? Uh, thanks, Matthew, for your question. Uh, shall I get you, Carla, to answer the first section of the question? I, I can do this, but you help me, please. Of yeah? course. So uh, <laughs> it'll be. If you could explain the verbatim technique. Yeah. I will, um, I'm sorry, my English is not perfect. So everyone, please, sorry. And Elton will help me. Well, this verbatim technique, I know um, from, from theater because I um, actually, uh, I studied theater and we have, um, there's a lot of this kind of, uh, mixing of documentary and um, documentation and fiction in theater in Brazil and also here in Germany where I live. So um, I always used to work with this kind of techniques. Um, then I, I, I lost a bit aside um, with this kind of work. And then when I started to write, uh, it was 2013. So I don't write so long. It, it's a new thing for me to be a writer uh, because I was an, uh, an actress and a director in theater. I went back to this kind of theater techniques and um, I, I uh, started to research a bit more on verbatim, on interviewing people and really transcribing the, the words they told me and not changing a lot. So that my book was, especially this first book, this mixture of uh, um, testimony and uh, fiction. I mean, I changed some things, it is fiction, but it is pretty much a testimony. Isn't it clear? I mean, yeah. uh, it's, it's perfectly, I think, everybody okay. can understand. Thank so, you. Matthew, um, I think by what Carla said, uh, and it, I was drawn immediately to this text because of the sense of language in action, so language in, in its performative function, if you like. And Carla uses a very a particular, very unconventional way, uh, a, a punctuation scheme to create the rhythm of this speaker who is tormented, let's say, with the, you know, with the subject. And it's very interesting and very challenging to translate as well. I think translation inevitably involves making substantial substantial change in the source text, and I'm not sure if if uh, I don't think reading comparatively is the best way of, of evaluating a translation. But if you can have access to the Portuguese, you can see that it's a different text in English. Uh, I've tried to maintain um, semantic correspondence with Carla's original as much as possible. So I think in that sense. Is, is quite uh, faithful, <laughs> I hate to say that word. Uh, but formally, the, the, the Portuguese is an inflected, highly inflected language and, and English is not so. So there are resources in the Portuguese language that are not available in the English, obviously, and vice versa. Uh, for instance, the use of the uh, hidden pronoun, so the pronoun in Portuguese is hidden, occult, in the verb. I think there's a technical name for that. Pronome oculto, Carla. It's an occult pronoun, it's in the verb. 
So I have to reinstate in many moments the, uh, the personal pronouns and, and there are other syntactic, syntactical features as well that are significantly uh, different in English. Uh, but it's, I think the language in action is, is, is a complete there because they are so contrasting the two layers of discourse. Uh, and what is fascinating that you learn in the middle of the story that actually that person who is describing the scene, he is meticulously, precisely describing the action and which in my view could be read as a, a stage directions. And you can see by Carla's background that there is an influence of, you know, uh, dramatic form in her, in her text throughout the text. So we learn that this person who is actually describing is actually the interlocutor, is the person that is hearing the story from this woman. Uh, it is just fascinating to translate. And uh, uh, hopefully you will see soon uh, Minha Murilo or one of Carlos' book in English, we are working on the translation as well. But I do strongly recommend if you are interested in see um, the, the complexities of the text on the page, and it's very intriguing from the point of view of an actor as well. If you see, it, if you see it as a dramatic text, text, it was intriguing for me when I started translated. I wanted to change the punctuation. That there's a lot of columns that Carla uses to ellipses to perhaps give the actor a bit more, you know, flexibility. But in a conversation with Carl, we decided to maintain, and I think it's the perfect decision. So it's up to the reader. And as Umberto Eco says, the text is a lazy machine. It requires the reader to work. And this is a text that if you see on the page, um, you will, it is intriguing. And I'm not the greatest actor, so my, actor, my actor's skills are not so developed. I wish I could really portray the force of that speech. Uh, but uh, I hope I have answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have one comment from the audience uh, from MJ. And uh, she said, thank you so much, Tess and Jenna for ushering us through such diverse and beautiful work. Carla and Elton, the work is stunning. Thank you. In seeing the visual, the repeated use of the column was striking. Thank you, the comments around the intricacies of use of punctuation. And she was going to ask, and bravo, bravo. <laughs> And we do have another question um, from Tess. Uh, she would love to know from Eliana how La Mata was received in her country and in the region. Thank you for your question, Tess. Uh, I think it was received. Um, there were like all, all types of responses. Uh, mm, Kind of like the political spread. Uh, as, uh, sorry, my English today is not very good. Uh, but in the political side, uh, now in Colombia, there has, or very recently, there has been a lot of, as I was saying in the beginning, uh, massacres by uh, that are like allowed by the Colombian government, um, mostly because we came from a lot of protests uh, against the neoliberal way that the country has been won for decades. Uh, so I guess like the book kind of like resonated with many people uh, there, how to, and I received like so many questions about how to, like what's the role of poetry and how can you write poetry in a, in a country like Colombia, uh, where there is like a, uh, where all these things that, uh, all these things that happen are happening right now, it's, it's complicated and at the same time we hear them all the time like these stories of killing and how to tell those stories like in a different way so uh i guess that there was also like some uh i don't know if the, if the word is um some people that were shocked about uh like how a book can talk about an experience that is not my uh, experience of violence because I wasn't, and I'm not even from that, the, from the region where it happened. Uh, but how can you talk about the experiences of other people related and violent experiences? And I, uh, I think that the question, or at least the way that I try to do it with this book is showing a lot of respect and compassion. And at the same time, 
trying to highlight not only the violence uh, that is, um, yeah, like committed against like people in order to take them out of their lands, and also like the strength of these people that are able to come back to those regions and reclaim their land, which is actually what happened in El Salado. So um, yeah, I think that's what I can say. It's it's a cell book that gets a lot of comments. And yeah, no, I'm happy about, about like having those conversations to and opening those conversations. Thank you so much, Eliana. And right now we do have two more questions from the audience. Um, here's one from Stephanie. She said, thank you everyone for your lovely readings. For any of the translators, when tackling colloquialisms, do you prefer to use whatever nearest phrases or idioms exist in English? Or do you try to say, stay closer to the original language, even if it makes for phrasing that may be unfamiliar to the reader? Um, does any of you would like to answer Stephanie's question? Any translator, writer? Yes, Robin. Thank you for the question, Stephanie. And I think it's sort of maybe a translator cop-out answer to say it depends. Um, but I, for me, it really does depend. And, and sometimes, depending on the context, it feels that the, the most important thing is to, I mean, I think colloquialisms themselves are so rooted in, in context and register in place and time. And sometimes because of what the story or the poem or the novel is, is doing in that particular passage, it feels important to relocate the colloquialism in, in, in English and in the context, in a linguistic context that feels the most natural to put it that way in English. But sometimes if the colloquialism itself is, is is addressing specifically something that is that is very localized. I feel it's really important to respect the specificity of that. Um, and so this isn't a colloquialism, but thinking about some of the poems that Eliana and I shared today, um, there are references to multiple kinds of plants and flowers, and many of them do have sort of identifiable equivalents in English, but some of them don't. And I felt that it was important to keep them in Spanish and to keep the sort of rootedness in that landscape. And I think um, I could say the same thing about colloquialisms too in other contexts. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, we have one more question from the audience. Um, this audience says, thank you, Dong, for your reading. We'd love to hear comments about interpretation of the last few lines. The meaning seemed to be that the bitter buckwheat the narrator recalled was both gone and remembered. The visual pictures were also so helpful. Are those pictures part of the work? OK, uh, so. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. And uh, so when we talk about the pictures, is that the pictures uh, we see uh, when the author Zuo, Zuo Zhongmei is reading um, in Chinese? Uh, no, <laughs> those pictures are not attached to the work. I wish we could have some kind of pictures, but definitely um, the author did her best to visualize, to help us visualize you know, what's in, in that prose. And, um, and, and I think that's really helpful. So this is a simplified version uh, uh, to, to our, qu our question and thank you. Thank you so much, Dong. Um, we do have one more question. Um, I think it's a pretty important question to raise um, posed by Catherine. Does anyone wish to speak to the general issue that women are published so infrequently in English translation roughly 30% of the time. Did anyone have trouble finding a publisher for the text you read today? Does any of our translators um, would like to speak to this question? Or Catherine, would you like to speak uh, more of your point of view with your question? I'll just say in general, this is a problem that we have as translators, but we also have it specifically within the Russian language community, the Russophone community, that only about 25 to 30% of what gets published in English is, is written originally by women. Um, and my own anecdotal experience is that if the writer is young and attractive, she might have more of a chance of getting published um, than another woman writer. Um, and I'm sort of curious what other people's experiences in other languages, other language groups 
might be. I will say regarding Anna Stadarbinitz and the book that, that, that I read from today, it is a book that deals with the subject of abortion. And in the American context, that was extremely difficult to begin with. Right? It had nothing to do with the gender of the author. It was just that a subject that was very, very difficult to, to find a publisher for. And we ended up going with the university press precisely because we thought that would give some, if, we, if a small independent press had taken the book, it could have been very difficult for them. Um, and and uh, we thought a university would give some protection to the publisher. Um, other people? Anyone else would like to jump in and speak to Catherine's question? Um, I just want to raise the point that I'm not sure how much the, the actual books written in English and published in, in the UK, for instance, reflect this proportion of uh, women and men authors, uh, as in the translated literature, uh, bearing in mind that only 4% of the all books published in England are in translation. The second thing, perhaps Carla might correct me, but uh, I, I have the impression that the literary system in Brazil is more inclusive, isn't it, Carla? There are uh, really like a new generation of uh, women's writers uh, just publishing uh, and including minority uh, writers from minority groups. Do you agree with me, Carla? Yeah, I think now uh, it's getting better, but I had just today um, the most important uh, newspaper for literature, Rascunho, Jornal Rascunho, has published a, um, a review or an interview actually with a, a, a professor for literature, and he should name the most important writers in uh, Brazil uh, from his opinion, and he named 24 birth people and 21 were men. <laughs> so uh, it was a big discussion because, come on, <laughs> we have so many women writing and he can name just three women among 24. I mean, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's not in the, it's changing, but it's not in the, in the head of the people. It's, I think. It looks like we have um, some time for a last question. If anyone wants to raise any question, any things that's on your mind about translation, feel free to ask. I do have one question. <laughs> uh, sorry, Tess, are you gonna say something? I, I just wanted to ask a follow-up to Catherine about, um, you know, did you make the decision to go with the university press before you got responses from independent or smaller, larger publishers, or was that a strategic decision going into your, um, you know, decision about whom to submit it to in the first place? Yeah, it was a strategic decision uh, going into the submission process. I just, I, I, for one other reason that we were thinking about was that the, like many translated books, we expected it to take a while to catch on. And so we wanted to go with a press that would keep the book in print um, until, until um, people heard about it and wanted to read it. Thank you all so much for answering the audience questions and each other's questions. Um, it looks like our time is closing, um, coming close to an end. And before we end the session, um, I'd like to bring Tess back to our session uh, for her introduction of our event today, which is really important and have brought so many important writers and translators to our session. And Tess, would you like to speak more about sure. it? I, uh, apologies for that audio glitch. Um, it's always difficult internet when you're getting international callers. So I'm not sure if anything I said registered, but the nice thing is someone has just posted a question that leads into my, um, my conclusionary introduction or introductionary conclusion, and that is, will these women in translate, will the women in translation program continue? Can we look forward to more? And yes, you can. As a personal introduction, I'm Tess Lewis, a past co-chair of the Penn Translation Committee. And um, today was the second of three events in the 2021 
series of bilingual readings brought to you by the Penn Translation Committee in celebration of Women in Translation Month. Um, the three events uh, next week, Thursday, same time, same place, um, are hosted by Penn America and you know, if you've missed any of these the fabulous writers and translators who are participating, recordings will be available on their website in the near future. So please tune in to that. Um, we've often thanked PEN America for hosting this. I'd like to do that again um, and translate the translation committee as well for their wonderful work in supporting um, translation and translators um, in the States and around the world. Thanks also go to the four co-organizers of this year's event, Nancy Naomi Carlson, Sharon Dolan, Peter Florchik, and today's moderator, uh, Jenna Tang. Um, thank you, a deep thank you to the panelists, to the translators and writers who have brought us these intensely personal, heart-wrenching and um, cathartic works today. Women in Translation Month is an initiative that was started in 2014 by the blogger Maytal Radzinski to address gender disparity in the field of translation. And Women in Translation Month aims to highlight women and non-binary writers and translators whose recognition and representation in literary publishing is essential to freedom of expression. The last 18 months have been devastating across the world from the pandemic to ongoing political violence. Forces of nationalism, greed, bigotry are at work sowing division and distrust. As we saw very clearly today, reading translations in this context is more important than ever because translation allows us to connect across language barriers. It opens up perspectives we might not otherwise have access to, and it highlights the universal aspects of these, these very intensely personal and private experiences. We're blessed with a virtual platform that allows us to reach more people than ever from around the world. I'm going to uh, retrospectively introduce um, Jenna Tang with thanks for her excellent moderation and her hard work bringing this panel together. Jenna is a New York-based translator selected for the 2021 American Literary Translators Association Emerging Translator Mentorship Program. She translates from Chinese and Spanish. Her translations have been published in Latin American Literature Today, the American writer, Asian American Writers Workshop, and elsewhere. Her interviews can be found on World, World Literature Today and Words Without Borders. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you so much for such a beautiful introduction and, and a beautiful thank you as well from Tess. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to I would also like to contribute my thanks um, to the session and to all the, the readers, panelists who have been so amazing with their readings. Um, I would like to thank again to the Penn Translation Committee, to my co-organizers, Nancy Naomi Carson, Helter Florchik, and Sharon Dolan, and also of course to Tess Lewis, to Rachel Roseman, and to all of you members of the audience for joining us today. Thank you so much and happy Women in Translation Month. Thank you.